Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on price return and total return, the differences between the two and how it's something to be aware of and how you might be able to help change how it's reported in the media. Your Investment Philosophy, a book we wrote, shameless plug available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. Don't make a step to sign. These are simple concepts. We'd like investors to better understand risk so they can make informed decisions. Just to start off, price and total return, there's two types of indices out there. And just briefly note what they are. So price return, price return index measures the performance of assets by tracking only the changes in the prices of the security. Securities. It excludes any income generated from dividends or interest payments. Total return. A total return index considers the price movements of the securities along with any dividends, interest or other income generated by the assets. It offers a fuller picture of the return an investor would receive from holding the assets in the index. So not a lot of people know about this. And this year, there's been a campaign started by Mark Hebner of IFA and many investors even in Australia, you've probably come across Mark's website, ifa.com at some point, very fantastic resource. And Mark himself has got a story about stockbrokers investing his money, which is why he eventually came to start IFA 25 years ago as an advice business. But to uh, celebrate the 25th anniversary, Mark was going to give a presentation and he, he wanted to put up a chart of the S&P 500 and how it had grown over the 25 years that he'd been in business. And he asked his team to put, put together a, a chart for him and they came back to him and said price or total. And Mark had always used total return. He was surprised to find what the difference was in returns because he hadn't really paid attention to the price uh, return before. And then he was even more surprised to learn that the media, in a lot of cases, would only use price and even sometimes wrongly use comparisons of price and total return when they were making a point. So because of that, Mark has started a petition to get the media to start using total return. So off the back of that, we thought we'd take a look at price and total return. Yeah, I think, Daniel, it's a very important point that investors need to be well aware of, whether it's stock markets, and I know that's what we're going to be referring to, uh, because the return on any stock is a sum of whether the price has changed, as in up or down, but also what dividends have been paid out by the company during the period the stock has been held. You can liken that to real estate, that whether it's the price of a domestic residence or a commercial building, the price may change and often will over time go up in value. But there is also the rent that's generated during the period that the property's held. The total return for the investor is a sum of the change in the price and the income received after any expenses that you incur holding that asset. So I guess we'll just start off by being humorous there. And why is it why is it important? Firstly, I guess it's for vanity and superficial reasons, because people can get themselves into trouble arguing about things they don't understand. And you don't want to be at a barbecue or dinner or on the internet even saying that the stock market's gone nowhere for 10 years when you've gone and looked at a price return chart and they actually know what a total return index is. No doubt you've had a few of these uh, discussions over the years, Peter. Absolutely. And you know, if people want to ignore the income stream that investments earn, even though they're acquiring that income stream during the period of time that they're trying to accumulate wealth, um, then I think they're looking at the results being attained by those assets quite wrongly. Uh, the total return is what investors get to spend, not just the price. And aside from vanity um, and potentially a bruised ego, there's actually the important reasons about price and total return because misinformation does mean poor decision making. And if you believe the market has done X when it's actually done Y, you may conclude there's no reason to invest and you may go off and do something else with your money or just leave it sitting in the bank because you believe it's been outperformed by something else. And I think that the media has got a lot to answer for on this score too. You know, you've only got to look at any of the news bulletins of an evening on the television. They only ever talk about the price. 
Yeah, so it's also easy to be disingenuous when someone is using data the wrong way and you get caught up, as you made the point there. Usually it's because of the media. They only use price-only indices, and it makes for a great headline when something goes wrong. Something's still behind its previous high or below where it was in 2007 because that one was trotted out many times, and we'll, we'll look at that one in a couple of charts time and see what was behind that. Here's another way that you can actually go wrong. If you stick the ASX 300 into Google, it will give you a chart, and it will only only be a price return chart. And I've, I've tried this. And if you then try to specify total return, you still get the price only chart. You actually have to dig around to find total return. This example on the right from investing.com, there's a couple of weeks difference in this chart because one's live and the other one ends at the end of the month. But if you just look at these charts and the difference in the increase and the points in the chart, the price only is around about 8,000 while the accumulation index is over 100,000. And one is up 21% over five years and the other one's up 47%. The difference between the two, it's pretty damn straightforward. It's effectively the dividend yield on the ASX 300 mm. for five years. The, the difference in the aggregate return is about 26%. And that's just the compounding of about a 4.5% dividend yield for five years. It's just maths, but it's quite profound when you look at the differences. And this is borne out in the price and total return data. This is a, a great example of the power of compounding. You look at the price return since 1992, the accumulated gain is 345%. So starting with a dollar, you've got $4.45. Great. But the green rail figures, which shows the dividends also included, you start with a dollar and you end up with $16.05. So only focus on the orange rail figures is folly. It's obviously more significant in Australia because the companies in Australia have a tend to pay out more in, more in dividends. But Mark even made the point in the US when he was asking about the difference in price and total return, it was about 2% per annum on the S&P 500, which still adds up. And globally, dividends generally because of the tax regimes in the home countries are lower. And to point to the US example of 2%, I think this is a pretty relevant and appropriate point to be made. Australia has a different capital gains tax regime to most developed world economies. We also have ranking credits available to be claimed by investors. As a result, Australian companies tend to pay out a much higher level of dividend. But the effect of not taking into account the income side of an investment is powerful, whether it's Australian or international. Growth of wealth, and this lays it out when someone used to say, well, the ASX is still below where it was in 2007. And that, that went on for quite some time. Uh, they weren't looking at the total return chart. They're only looking at the price chart. And that just shows why it's important to take into account the income paid because that shows a true reflection of what the investors receive. Investor returns from the time you invest are the sum of all your future cash flows, which is you know, your future income plus your future sale price not just the future sale price. Always look for total return or accumulation data. And this extends to ETFs when the same thing that we were talking there before about putting a, an ETF code into Google, they'll only give you the price return in those charts. The media, they're only going to give you price only returns. Um, and we all get dividends and distributions. We may not all reinvest them, but we did get them. So it's important to factor in when you're looking at long-term returns for indices. Critical that investors make sure that the evidence they're looking at is actually telling them the whole story. Finally, just encourage you to go and sign Mark's petition at ifa.com forward slash petition. And he's got a lot of good resources on that page where you can delve further into this topic. Source and descriptions of data. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye for now.